Werebores existed within World of Darkness. They had a terrible tribe name. They are one of the lost or extinct changing breeds. And in this video, I'm going to tell you their story and how you might incorporate them into your own games. So stay tuned for that. The Werebores went by the name of the Gronder, G-R-O-N-D-R, which sounds very similar to a dating app that exists for men. The Gronder were a very active and a very aggressive breed. They were a communal tribe. They traveled in packs, and those packs were called Sounders. Each Sounder was led by a king or queen who had bested all of their opponents in ritual combat. So who were the Gronder? To say that they were efficient hunters is a bit of an understatement. This is something that they absolutely excelled at. They were also very cautious. Unlike their Guru companions, whenever they went in to remove a blight or clear out a infestation of the worm, they were very careful to not harm Gaia in the process. The Gronder respected and revered Gaia. They also greatly appreciated places of natural beauty, not only physically, but in the landscape as well. This is probably because their own physical appearance is quite brutish, and as a result, many of the areas that they oversaw were extremely beautiful and lush. They had fertile ground everywhere they went. So if they were such good caretakers of the land and good stewards of what they were given, why did the Gronder disappear? During the first War of Rage, when all of the Pharaoh were picking sides, the Gronder, they sided with the Gral, the Werebears. This greatly angered the Guru. They were a little jealous of the cultivation skills that they had, but they had also learned about a ritual that the Werebores were using that disturbed them greatly. As a result, the Werewolves believed that the Werebores were worm-tainted and beyond redemption, so they destroyed them, they sought them out, and killed them. Now the Werebores were very good fighters as I mentioned, and they laid heavy, heavy casualties to the Fianna, the Geta Fenris, and the Silver Fangs, so they did not go down without a fight. With the race basically gone, the Kinfolk were enslaved by the Guru, and it wasn't until the last Kinfolk remained that they made a very desperate choice in making a pact with the Worm. They were designed to be the cleaners and groomers of Gaia. It's why they were so good at cultivating the land. They were there to heal the earth after a blight or some form of corruption had been removed. So you can bet when the worm was finally able to get their hands on the Gronder and their kinfolk, it absolutely corrupted them into something that is not their purpose, as it so often does. This is where we get the creation of the Skull Pigs. Skull Pigs are a mockery of the Gronder's purpose, what they were originally intended to be. Skull Pigs are just horrible beasts. They feast on the flesh, the dead flesh of animals or other pharaoh that they have killed. They live on garbage, toxic waste. Quite often times you'll find that a Skull Pig's flesh is very poisonous. They also aren't very intelligent. They don't have much high reasoning skills. It's You can't talk one down. It is possible for them to gain intelligence, but they would first have to have consumed some other intelligent worm creature. Those skull pigs who have gained their intelligence, they have gained their mind powers back. They are also able to use shadow magics very similar to that of the Bastet. These are very fearsome creatures and they are known as voodoo pigs. Only the Makole or the Gral have any history or fragments that proved the Gronder existed, or even what they were like. Now the Gronder had a little bit of their own hubris. They believed that they were incorruptible, that it was just not something that could happen to them. This belief system gave them courage, and partly one reason why they would charge head first into Bane's nests to clear out the corruption. It also didn't stop them from wandering into blights or hell holes. And because of their skill set, they were very effective at cleaning up these areas. Part of how they did this is they were able to eat, consume the taint of the worm, and it would disappear. They definitely used this ability to hunt banes and other minions of the worm 
but it's this ability that also allowed them to clean up the blights in the hell holes. Now a blight, this is an area of the penumbra which has been damaged somehow. Usually this occurs in places in the penumbra where the worm and the weaver come into conflict with each other. There's lots of banes in urban areas, so this is where there's a lot of conflict that happens. Guru have been known to use blights as training grounds for cubs. Now a hellhole is slightly different. A hellhole is just an area within the penumbra that has been completely corrupted and tainted by the worm. When you're in the physical realm, the material plane, it's usually a toxic waste site, a garbage dump, something that pollutes and kills the land and makes it toxic. Two very famous hell holes can be found in the United States. One is in the Yucatan Mountains. This particular site was used as a storage facility for spent nuclear rods and toxic waste. The second one is called the Fresh Kills Landfill Center, and this is a massive, massive landfill in New York. Unfortunately, with the werebores gone, no one can clean up these sites. The Uctena have tried, they're just not very successful at it. At best, they've been able to keep the Banes at bay. Now, when it came to rooting out and destroying corruption, the werebores were excellent at this, not only within the physical landscape itself, but also within other shape changers as well. Every attempt would be made to save the victim, but if it was not possible, then they were perfectly okay with destroying the non-savable victim. Now, unfortunately, the Gronder were not as discerning in their evaluation of worm taint. If someone was too ambitious or too prideful, that could be considered taint of the worm. And Gronder investigators, they were very persistent and they were not well liked. Now, before we move on talking about how the werebores fell from grace and became targets. If you're enjoying today's video, please let me know by hitting the thumbs up button as that really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. And if you want to see more videos like this from myself, then please hit subscribe with the bell notification. This particular video was made possible by my patrons over on Patreon as they voted on this video topic for April. If you want to get a say in what I produce next, then consider joining me on Patreon. Now, the werebores, they were known as huge eaters. There wasn't much that you could put in front of them that they would not eat. And because they were capable of digesting even worm taint, there really isn't much you couldn't put in their stomach that wouldn't disappear. Many werebores were very proud of their ability to consume taint and not have it affect them in any way. Some would even seek out other spirits to help them develop even more weapons that they could use against the worm. But much like the Camazots, and like the Camazots, this gift was misunderstood by most of the Fera, not just the werewolves. It was just unfathomable to the Fera that a creature could walk into such a concentrated area of worm taint and come out completely unaffected. And at some point, some of them even began to believe that the werebores they were just corrupted themselves, and that's why they were not getting this taint whenever they went into these dangerous places. The werebores didn't help their optic problems when they developed an ability or a skill that allowed them to consume a bane that was infesting a person or places, or maybe even some things in some cases. While the bane was being digested this way, the Gronder was able to use the abilities of the bane they consumed. You can see why they had a bit of a optics or PR problem with some of the other Fera. Not only could they now consume worm taint, but they could use those same abilities to great effect as weapons against the worm, but the other changing breeds they just didn't understand. It was only further proof that they were corrupted in some way. Combine that with the werebore inquisitors who, when rooting out corruption, usually made fools and set very hard examples of other fera, it's understandable why they were not very well liked. And to add further insult to injury, when the War of Rage broke out and Farah needed to pick a side, when the werebores went against the Guru, that was just the nail in the coffin for them. And the werewolves, they went nuts and they targeted and slaughtered the werebores. Now the other Fera, they knew that the werewolves had very bad plans for the werebores, for the Gronder. But because the anger wasn't targeted at them, 
they weren't particularly concerned. That was until, of course, that the rest of the Fera and even the, the Beast Courts, the Henji, okay, when they became aware that the werewolf's plan was complete and total annihilation of the species, it was already too late to act. By that point, many of the Grandeur had been destroyed, and there weren't that many around in the Beast Courts to begin with. And at this point, the Henji Okei, to save face, they actually removed and purged all Werebore stories and histories from their records. It was a huge betrayal. So it's completely understandable that in this case, that the remaining kinfolk, after the mass slaughter and extinction of their species, turned instead to the worm to try to figure out a way to continue living and probably get some revenge against the Guru. And if not the Guru, then at least the Beast Courts. Now, when it came to the other Fera, the Grandeur had a particularly strong relationship with the Gral, which is why they sided with them in the War of Rage. They very commonly worked together when healing Gaia. The Werebores would root out the corruption, and the Gural, the Werebears, they would heal her. And in the War of Rage, it wasn't just the Guru who had actively targeted the Grandeur. It was also the Naga. They were slighted in the sense that they felt rooting out corruption within the Pharaoh was their job and their sole purpose. So the Naga also played a part in the destruction of the Werebores. Now, if you were looking to use the Werebores in your games, there is a couple of ways that you could bring them back. One is going to be an obvious redemption arc. It would be possible to get a sounder of the Skull Pigs and clean the corruption from them likely with the aid of a Gural, It would also be believable that maybe some of their members or some of the tribe were harbored in the Umbra by a spirit or a sympathetic spirit, convincing the tribe to come out of the Umbra back to the regular world for repopulation. This will be a difficult task, but it is one way that I would incorporate them into a game. If you enjoyed hearing about this lost tribe, you will probably enjoy the video on your screen now. Tell me in the comments below what you thought about the Grandeur. And to all of my patron supporters who have continued to support me, thank you for everything that you do and for voting on this video. My name's Nathaniel. Thanks for stopping by, everyone.